Ethan Brand by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Bartram the lime burner, a rough, heavy looking man, begrimed with charcoal, sat watching his kiln at nightfall, while his little son played at building houses with the scattered fragments of marble, when on the hillside below them they heard a roar of laughter, not mirthful, but slow and even solemn, like a wind shaking the boughs of the forest. Father, what is that? asked the little boy, leaving his play and pressing betwixt his father's knees. Oh, some drunken man, I suppose, answered the lime burner. Some merry fellow from the barroom in the village who dared not laugh loud enough within doors, lest he should blow the roof of the house off. So here he is, shaking his jolly sides at the foot of Greylock. But father, said the child, more sensitive than the obtuse middle-aged clown, he does not laugh like a man that is glad, so the noise frightens me. Don't be a fool, child, cried his father gruffly. You will never make a man, I do believe. There's too much of your mother in you. I have known the rustling of a leaf startle you. Hark, here comes the merry fellow now. You shall see there is no harm in him. Bartram and his little son, while they were talking thus, sat watching the same lime kiln that had been the scene of Ethan Brand's solitary and meditative life before he began his search in the unpardonable sin. Many years, as we have seen, had now elapsed since that portentous night when the idea was first developed. The kiln, however, on the mountainside stood unimpaired and was in nothing changed since he had thrown his dark thoughts into the intense glow of its furnace, melted them, as it were, into the one thought that took possession of his life. It was a rude, round, tower-like structure about twenty feet high, heavily built of rough stones, and with a hillock of earth heaped about the larger part of its circumference, so that the blocks and the fragments of marble might be drawn by cartloads and thrown in at the top. There was an opening at the bottom of the tower like an oven mouth, but large enough to admit a man in a stooping posture and provided with a massive iron door. With the smoke and jets of flame issuing from the chinks and crevices of this door, which seemed to give admittance into the hillside, it resembled nothing so much as a private entrance to the infernal regions, which the shepherds of the delectable mountains were accustomed to show pilgrims. There are many such lime kilns in that tract of country for the purpose of the burning of white marble which composes a large part of the substance of the hills. Some of them built years ago and long deserted, with weeds growing in the vacant round of the interior which is open to the sky, and grass and wildflowers rooting themselves into the chinks of the stones, look already like relics of antiquity, and may yet be overspread with the lichens of centuries to come. Others where the lime burner still feeds his daily and night-long fire afford points of interest to the wanderer among the hills, who seats himself on a log of wood or a fragment of marble to hold a chat with the solitary man. It is a lonesome, and one of the characters inclined to thought may be an intensely thoughtful occupation, as it proved in the case of Ethan Brand, who had mused to such strange purpose in days gone by while the fire in this very kiln was burning. The man who now watched the fire was of a different order, and troubled himself with no thoughts save the very few that were requisite to his business. At frequent intervals, he flung back the clashing weight of the iron door, and turning his face from the insufferable glare, thrust in huge logs of oak, or stirred the immense brands with a long pole. Within the furnace were seen the curling and riotous flames, and the burning marble almost molten with the intensity of heat. While without, the reflection of the fire quivered on the dark intricacy of the surrounding forest, and showed in the foreground a bright and ruddy little picture of the hut, the spring beside its door, the athletic and coal-begrimed figure of the lime-burner, and the half-frightened child shrinking into the protection of his father's shadow. And when again the iron door was closed, then reappeared the tender light of the half-full moon, which vainly strove to trace out the indistinct shapes of the neighboring mountains. And in the upper sky there was a flitting congregation of clouds, still faintly tinged with the rosy sunset, though thus far down into the valley the sunshine had vanished long and long ago. The little boy now crept still closer to his father, as footsteps were heard ascending the hillside, and a human form thrust aside the bushes that clustered beneath the trees. Hello, who is it? cried the lime burner, vexed at his son's timidity, yet half infected by it. Come forward and show yourself like a man, while I'll fling this chunk of marble at your head. 
You offer me a rough welcome, said a gloomy voice as the unknown man drew nigh. Yet I neither claim nor desire a kinder one, even at my own fireside. To obtain a distincter view, Bartram threw open the iron door of the kiln, which immediately issued a gush of fierce light that smote full upon the stranger's face and figure. To a careless eye there appeared nothing very remarkable in his aspect, which was that of a man in a coarse, brown, country-made suit of clothes, tall and thin with the staff and heavy shoes of a wayfarer. As he advanced, he fixed his eyes, which were very bright, intently upon the brightness of the furnace, as if he beheld or expected to behold some object worthy of note within it. "'Good evening, stranger,' said the lime-burner. "'Whence come you so late in the day?' "'I come from my search,' answered the wayfarer, "'for at last it is finished.' <laughs> "'Drunk or crazy,' muttered Bartram to himself. "'I shall have trouble with the fellow. "'The sooner I drive him away, the better.' "'The little boy, all in a tremble, "'whispered to his father and begged him to shut the door of the kiln, "'so that there might not be so much light, "'for that was something in the man's face "'that he was afraid to look at, "'yet could not look away from. "'And indeed, even the lime burner's dull and torpid sense "'began to be impressed by an indescribable something "'in that thin, rugged and thoughtful visage with the grizzled hair hanging wildly about it and those deeply sunken eyes which gleamed like fires within the entrance of a mysterious cavern but as he closed the door the stranger turned towards him and spoke in a quiet familiar way that made bartram feel as if he were a sane and sensible man after all your task draws to an end i see said he this marble has already been burning three days a few more hours will convert the stone to lime "'Why, who are you?' exclaimed the lime-burner. "'You seem as well acquainted with my business as I am myself.' "'And well may I be,' said the stranger, "'for I have followed the same craft many a long year, "'and here, too, on this very spot. "'But you are a newcomer in these parts. "'Did you never hear of Ethan Brand?' "'The man that went in search of the unpardonable sin?' "'asked Bartram with a laugh. "'The same,' answered the stranger. "'He has found what he sought, and... Therefore he comes back again. What? Then you are Ethan Brand himself, cried the lime burner in amazement. Well, I am a newcomer here, as you say, and they call it eighteen years since you left the foot of Greylock. But I can tell you the good folks still talk about Ethan Brand in the village yonder, and what a strange errand took him away from his lime kiln. Well, and so you found the unpardonable sin. Even so, said the stranger calmly. If the question is a fair one, proceeded Bartram, where might it be? Ethan Brand laid his finger on his own heart. Here, replied he. And then without mirth in his countenance, but as if moved by an involuntary recognition of the infinite absurdity of seeking throughout the world for what was the closest of all things to himself, and looking into every heart save his own for what was hidden in no other breast, he broke into a laugh of scorn. It was the same slow, heavy laugh that had almost appalled the lime-burner when it heralded the wayfarer's approach. The solitary mountainside was made dismal by it. Laughter, when out of place, mistimed or bursting forth from a disordered state of feeling, may be the most terrible modulation in the human voice. The laughter of one asleep, even if it be a little child, or the madman's laugh, the wild, screaming laugh of a born idiot, are sounds that we are sometimes trembling to hear, it would always willingly forget. Poets have imagined no utterance of fiends or hobgoblins so fearfully appropriate as laugh, and even the obtuse lime-burner felt his nerves shaken as this strange man looked inward at his own heart and burst into laughter that rolled away into the night and was indistinctly reverberated among the hills. Joe, said he to his little son, scamper down to the tavern in the village and tell the jolly fellows there that Ethan Brand has come back. And that he's found the unpardonable sin. The boy darted away on his errand, to which Ethan Brand made no objection, nor seemed hardly to notice it. He sat on a log of wood, looking steadfastly at the iron door of the kiln. When the child was out of sight, and his swift and light footsteps ceased to be heard treading fast on the fallen leaves, and then on the rocky mountain path, the lime burner began to regret his departure. He felt that the little fellow's presence had been a barrier between his guest and himself, and that he must now deal, heart to heart, 
with a man who in his own confession had committed the one and only crime for which heaven could afford no mercy. That crime in its indistinct blackness seemed to overshadow him. The lime burner's own sins rose up within him and made his memory riotous with a throng of evil shapes that asserted their kindred with the master sin, whatever it might be, which was within the scope of man's corrupted nature to conceive and cherish. They were all of one family. They went to and fro between his breast and Ethan Brand's, and carried dark greetings from one to the other. Then Bartram remembered the stories which had grown traditional in reference to this strange man who had come upon him like a shadow of the night and was making himself at home in his old place after so long an absence that the dead people, dead and buried for years, would have more to be right at home in any familiar spot than he. Ethan Brand, it was said, had conversed with Satan himself in the lurid blaze of this very kiln. The legend had been matter of mirth heretofore, but it looked grisly now. According to this tale, before Ethan Brand had departed on his search, he had been accustomed to evoke a fiend from the hot furnace of the lime kiln, night after night, in order to confer with him about the unpardonable sin. The man and the fiend each laboring to frame the image of some mode of guilt which could neither be atoned for nor forgiven. And with the first gleam of light upon the mountain top, the fiend crept in at the iron door, there to abide the intensest elements of fire until again summoned forth to share in the dreadful task of extending man's possible guilt beyond the scope of heaven's else infinite mercy. While the lime burner was struggling with the horror of these thoughts, Ethan Brand rose from the log and flung open the door of the kiln. The action was in such accordance with the idea in Bartram's mind that he almost expected to see the evil one issue forth, red hot from the raging furnace. Hold, hold, cried he with a tremulous attempt to laugh for he was ashamed of his fears, although they overmastered him. Don't, for mercy's sake, bring out your devil now. Man, sternly replied Ethan Brand. What need have I of the devil? I have left him behind me on my track. It is with such halfway sinners as you that he busies himself. Fear not, because I open the door. I do but act on my old custom, and am going to trim your fire like a lime burner as I was once. He stirred the vast coals, thrust in more wood, and bent forward to gaze into the hollow prison house of the fire, regardless of the fierce glow that reddened upon his face. The lime burner sat watching him, and half suspected his strange guess of a purpose, if not to evoke a fiend, at least to plunge bodily into the flames, and thus vanish from the sight of man. Ethan Brand, however, drew quietly back, and closed the door of the kiln. "'I have looked,' said he, "'into many a human heart that was seven times hotter with sinful passions than yonder furnaces with fire. But I found out there what I thought was sought. Nope, not the unpardonable sin. What is the unpardonable sin? asked the lime burner, and then he shrank further from his companion, trembling lest his question should actually be answered. It is a sin that grew within my own breast, replied Ethan Brand, standing erect and with a pride that distinguishes all enthusiasts of his stamp. A sin that grew nowhere else. The sin of an intellect that triumphed over the sense of brotherhood with man and reverence for God, and sacrificed everything to its own mighty claims. The only sin that deserves a recompense of immortal agony. Freely were it to do it again, I would incur the guilt, but unshrinkingly accept the retribution. Well, the man's head is turned, muttered the lime burner to himself. He may be a sinner like the rest of us, nothing more likely but I'll be sworn he's a madman too. Nevertheless, he felt uncomfortable at his situation alone with Ethan Brand on the wild mountainside, and was right glad to hear the rough murmur of tongues and the footsteps of what seemed a pretty numerous party stumbling over the stones and rustling through the underbrush. Soon appeared the whole lazy regiment that was wont to invest, infest the village tavern, comprehending three or four individuals who had drunk flip beside the barroom fire through all the winters and smoked their pipes beneath the stoop through all the summers, since Ethan Brand's departure. Laughing boisterously and mingling all their voices together in unceremonious talk, they now burst into the moonshine and narrow streaks of the firelight that illuminated the open space before the lime kiln. Bartram set the door ajar again, flooding the spot with light, that the whole company might get a fair view of Ethan Brand, and he of them. 
There, among other old acquaintances, was a once ubiquitous man, now almost extinct, but whom we were formerly sure to encounter at the hotel of every thriving village throughout the country. It was the stage agent. The present specimen of the genus was wilted and smoke-dried man, wrinkled and red-nosed in a smartly cut, brown bobtailed coat with brass buttons, who, for a length of time unknown, had kept his desk and corner in the bar room, and was still puffing what seemed to be the same cigar that he had lighted twenty years before. He had great fame as a dry joker, although perhaps less on account of any intrinsic humor than from a certain flavor of brandy toddy and tobacco smoke, which impregnated all of his ideas and expressions, as well as his person. Another well-remembered, though strangely altered face, was that of Lawyer Giles, as people still called him in courtesy. An elderly ragamuffin in his soiled shirt sleeves and toe-cloth trousers, this poor fellow had been an attorney in what he called his better days, a sharp practitioner in great vogue among the village litigants. But flip and sling and toddy and cocktails imbibed at all hours, morning, noon, and night, had caused him to slide from intellectual to various kinds and degrees of bodily labor. Till at last, to adopt his own phrase, he slid into a soap fat. In other words, Giles was now a soap boiler in a small way. He'd come to be but the fragment of a human being, a part of one foot having been chopped off by an axe, and an entire hand worn away by the devilish grip of a steam engine. Yet though the corporeal hand was gone, a spiritual member remained, for stretching forth the stump, Giles steadfastly averred that he felt an invisible thumb and fingers with as vivid a sensation as before the real ones were amputated. A maimed and miserable wretch he was, but one, nevertheless, whom the world could not trample on and had no right to scorn, either in this or any previous stage of his misfortunes, since he'd still kept up the courage and spirit of a man, asked nothing in charity, and with his one hand, not the left one, fought a stern battle against want and hostile circumstances. Among the throng, too, came another personage, who, with certain points of similarity to Lawyer Giles, had many more of difference. It was the village doctor, a man of some fifty years whom, at an earlier period of his life, we introduced as paying a professional visit to Ethan Brand during the latter's supposed insanity. He was now a purple-visaged, rude and brutal, yet half-gentlemanly figure with something wild, ruined, and desperate in his talk, and in all the details of his gesture and manners. Brandy possessed this man like an evil spirit, and made him as surly and savage as a wild beast, and as miserable as a lost soul. But there was supposed to be in him such wonderful skill, such native gifts of healing, beyond any which medical science could impart, that society caught hold of him and would not let him sink out of its reach. So, swaying to and fro upon his horse, and grumbling thick accents at the bedside, he visited all the sick chambers for miles about them among the mountain towns, and sometimes raised a dying man, as it were, by miracle, or quite as often, no doubt, sent his patient to a grave that was dug many a year too soon. The doctor had an everlasting pipe in his mouth, and as somebody said, in allusion to his habit of swearing, he was always alight with hellfire. These three worthies pressed forward and greeted Ethan Brand, each after his own fashion, earnestly inviting him to partake of the contents of a certain black bottle, in which, as they averred, he would find something far better worth seeking than the unpardonable sin. No mind, which has wrought itself by intense and solitary meditation into a high state of enthusiasm, can endure the kind of contact with low and vulgar modes of thought and feeling to which Ethan Brand was now subjected. It made him doubt and strange to say it was a painful doubt, whether he had indeed found the unpardonable sin, and found it within himself. The whole question on which he had exhausted life, and more than life, looked like a delusion. Leave me, he said bitterly, ye brute beasts that have made yourselves so, shriveling up your souls with fiery liquors. I have done with you. Years and years ago I groped into your hearts and found nothing there for my purpose. Get ye gone. "'Why, you uncivil scoundrel!' cried the fierce doctor. "'Is that the way you respond to the kindness of your best friends? "'Then let me tell you the truth. "'You have no more found the unpardonable sin than yonder boy Joe has. "'You are but a crazy fellow. "'I told you so twenty years ago. "'Neither better nor worse than a crazy fellow, "'and the fit companion of old Humphrey here.' "'He pointed to an old man shabbily dressed with long white hair, 
a thin visage and unsteady eyes. For some years past, this aged person had been wandering about the hills, inquiring of all travelers whom he met for his daughter. The girl, it seemed, had gone off with a company of circus performers, and occasionally tidings of her came to the village, and fine stories were told of her glittering appearance as she rode on horseback in the ring, or performed marvelous feats on the tightrope. The white-haired father now approached Ethan Brand and gazed unsteadily into his face. "'They tell me you've been all over the earth,' said he, wringing his hands with earnestness. "'You must have seen my daughter, for she makes a grand figure in the world, and everybody goes to see her. Did she send any word to her old father, or say when she was coming back?' Ethan Brand's eye quailed beneath the old man's. That daughter from whom he so earnestly desired a word of greeting was the Esther of our tale, the very girl whom with such cold and remorseless purpose— Ethan Brand had made the subject of a psychological experiment, and wasted, absorbed, and perhaps annihilated her soul in the process. Yes, murmured he, turning away from the hoary wanderer. It is no delusion. There is an impartable sin. While these things were passing, a merry scene was going forward in the area of cheerful light, beside the spring and before the door of the hut. A number of the youth of the village, young men and girls, had hurried up the hillside, impelled by curiosity to see Ethan Brand, the hero of so many a good legends, familiar to their childhood. Finding nothing, however, very remarkable in his aspect, nothing but a sunburnt wayfarer in plain garb and dusty shoes, who sat looking into the fire as if he fancied pictures among the coals, these young people speedily grew tired of observing him. As it happened, there was another amusement at hand, an old German Jew, "'Traveling with a diorama on his back, "'was passing down the mountain road towards the village "'just as the party turned aside from it. "'And in hopes of eking out the profits of the day, "'the showman had kept them company to the lime kiln. "'Come, old Dutchman,' cried one of the young men. "'Let us see your pictures if you can swear they are looking at.' "'Oh, yes, Captain,' answered the Jew, "'whether as a matter of courtesy or craft, "'he styled everybody Captain. "'I shall show you indeed some very superb pictures.' So, placing his box in a proper position, he invited the young men and girls to look through the glass orifices of the machine, and proceeded to exhibit a series of the most outrageous scratchings and dabbings, a specimen of the fine arts that ever an itinerant showman had the face to impose upon his circle of spectators. The pictures were worn out, moreover tattered, full of cracks and wrinkles, and dingy with tobacco smoke and otherwise in a most pitiable condition. Some purported to be cities, public edifices, and ruined castles in Europe. Others represented Napoleon's battles and Nelson's sea fights. And in the midst of these would be seen a gigantic, brown and hairy hand, which might have been mistaken for the hand of destiny, though in truth it was only the showman's, pointing its forefinger to the various scenes of the conflict, while its owner gave historical illustrations. When with much merriment at its abominable deficiency of merit, the exhibition was concluded, the German bade little Joe put his head into the box. Viewed through the magnifying glasses, the boy's round, rosy visage assumed the strangest imaginable aspect of an immense, titanic child, the mouth grinning broadly and the eyes and every other feature overflowing with fun at the joke. Suddenly, however, that merry face turned pale, and its expression changed to horror, for this easily impressed and excitable child had become sensible that the eye of Ethan Brand was fixed upon him through the glass. "'You make the little man to be afraid, Captain,' said the German Jew, "'turning up the dark and strong outline of his visage from his stooping posture. "'But to look again, and by chance, I shall cause you to see "'somewhat that is very fine upon my word.' "'Ethan Brand gazed into the box for an instant, "'and then, starting back, looked fixedly at the German. "'What had he seen? "'Nothing, apparently, for a curious youth who had peeped in almost at the same moment "'beheld only a vacant space of canvas.' "'I remember you now,' muttered Ethan Brand to the showman. "'Ah, Captain,' answered the Jew of Nuremberg with a sm dark smile. "'I find it to be a heavy matter in my showbox, this unpardonable sin. "'By my faith, Captain, it has wearied my shoulders this long day to carry it over the mountain.' "'Peace,' answered Ethan Brand sternly. "'Or get thee into the furnace yonder.' The Jew's exhibition had scarcely concluded when a great elderly dog, who seemed to be his own master, as no person in the company laid claim to him, saw fit to render himself the object of public notice. 
Hitherto he'd shown himself a very quiet and well-disposed old dog, going round from one to another and, by way of being sociable, offering his rough head to be patted by any kindly hand that would take so much trouble. But now, all of a sudden, this grave and venerable quadruped, of his own mere motion and without the slightest suggestion from anybody else, began to run round after his tail, which, to heighten the absurdity of the proceeding, was a great deal shorter than it should have been. Never was seen such a headlong eagerness in pursuit of an object that could not possibly be attained. Never was heard such tremendous outbreak of growling and snarling and barking and snapping, as if one of the ridiculous brute's body were at deadly and most unforgivable enmity at the other. Faster and faster, round about went the cur, and faster and still faster fled the unapproachable brevity of his tail. And louder and fiercer grew his yells of rage and animosity, until utterly exhausted and as far from the goal as ever. The foolish old dog ceased his performance as suddenly as he'd begun it. The next moment he was as mild, quiet, sensible, and respectable in his deportment as when he had first scraped acquaintance with the company. As may be supposed, the exhibition was greeted with universal laughter, clapping of hands and shouts of encore, to which the canine performer responded by wagging all that was there to wag of his tail. But he appeared totally unable to repeat this very successful effort to amuse the spectators. Meanwhile, Ethan Brand had resumed his seat upon the log, and moved, it might be, by a perception of some remote analogy between his own case and that of this self-pursuing cur, and he broke into the awful laugh which, more than any other token, expressed the condition of his inward being. From that moment the merriment of the party was at an end. They stood aghast, dreading lest the inauspicious sound which should be reverberated around the horizon, and that mountain would thunder it to the mountain and so the horror be prolonged upon their ears. Then, whispering to another that it was late, that the moon was almost down, that the August night was growing chill, they hurried homewards, leaving the lime burner and little Joe to deal with as they might with their unwelcome guest. Save for these three human beings, the open space on the hillside was a solitude, set in a vast gloom of forest. Beyond that darksome verge, the firelight glimmered on the stately trunks and almost black foliage of pines, intermixed with the lighter verdure of sapling oaks, maples, and poplars, while here and there lay the gigantic corpses of dead trees, decaying on the leaf-strewn soil. And it seemed to little Joe, a timorous and imaginative child, that the silent forest was holding its breath until some fearful thing should happen. Ethan Brand thrust more wood into the fire and closed the door of the kiln, and then looking over his shoulder at the lime burner and his son, he bade rather than advise them to retire to rest. For myself I cannot sleep, he said he. I have matters that it concerns me to meditate upon. I will watch the fire, as I used to do in old times. And call the devil out of the furnace to keep you company, I suppose, muttered Bartram, who had been making intimate acquaintance with the black bottle above mentioned. But watch, if you like, and call as many devils as you like. For my part, I shall be all the better for a snooze. Come, Joe. As the boy followed his father into the hut, he looked back at the wayfarer and the tears came into his eyes, for his tender spirit had an intuition of the bleak and terrible loneliness in which this man had enveloped himself. When they had gone, Ethan Brand sat listening to the crackling of the kindled wood, and looking at the little spirits of fire that issued through the chinks of the door. These trifles, however, once so familiar, had but the slightest hold of his attention, while deep within his mind he was reviewing the gradual but marvelous change that had been wrought upon him to, by the search to which he had devoted himself. He remembered how the night dew had fallen upon him, how the dark forest had whispered to him, how the stars had gleamed upon him. A simple and loving man watching his fire in the years gone by and ever musing as it burned. He remembered with what tenderness and with what love and sympathy for mankind, and what pity for human guilt and woe, he had first begun to contemplate those ideas, which afterwards became the inspiration of his life. With what reverence he had then looked into the heart of man, viewing it as a temple originally divine, and however desecrated still to be held sacred by a brother. With what awful fear he had deprecated the success of his pursuit, and prayed that the unpardonable sin might never be revealed to him. Then ensued that vast intellectual development, which in its progress disturbed the counterpoise between his mind and heart. 
the idea that possessed his life had operated as a means of education. It had gone on cultivating his powers to the highest point of which they were susceptible. It had raised him from the level of an unlettered laborer to stand on a starlit eminence, whither the philosophers of the earth, laden with the lore of universities, might vainly strive to clamber after him. So much for the intellect. But where was the heart? That indeed had withered, had contracted, had hardened, had perished. It had ceased to partake of the universal throb. He had lost his hold of the magnetic chain of humanity. He was no longer a brother man, opening the chambers of the dungeons of our common nature by the key of holy sympathy, which gave him a right to share in all of its secrets. He was now a cold observer, looking on mankind as the subject of his experiment, and at length converting man and woman to be his puppets, and pulling the wires that moved them to such degrees of crime as were demanded for his study. Thus Ethan Brand became a fiend. He began to be so from the moment that his moral nature had ceased to keep the pace of improvement with his intellect. And now as his highest effort and inevitable development, as the bright and gorgeous flower and rich delicious fruit of his life's labor, he had produced the unpardonable sin. What more have I to seek? What more to achieve? said Ethan Brand to himself. My task is done and well done. Starting from the log with a certain alacrity in his gait, and ascending the hillock of earth that was raised against the stone circumference of the lime kiln, he thus reached the top of the structure. It was a space of perhaps ten feet across from edge to edge, presenting a view of the upper surface of the immense mass of broken marble with which the kiln was heaped. All these innumerable blocks and fragments of marble were red-hot and vividly on fire, sending up great spouts of blue flame which quivered aloft and danced madly as within a magic circle, and sank and rose again with continual and multitudinous activity. As the lonely man bent forward over this terrible body of fire, the blasting heat smote up against his person with a breath, that it might be scorched and shriveled him up in a moment. Ethan Brand stood erect and raised his arms on high. The blue flames played upon his face and imparted the wild and ghastly light which alone would have suited his expression. It was that of a fiend, on the verge of plunging into his gulf of intensest torment. O oh, Mother Earth, cried he, who art th no more my mother, into whose bosom this frame shall never be resolved. O oh, mankind, whose brotherhood I have cast off, and trampled that great heart beneath my feet. O oh, stars of heaven that shone on me of old, as if to light me onward and upward. Farewell, all and forever. Come, deadly element of fire, henceforth my familiar friend. Embrace me as I do thee. That night the sound of a fearful peal of laughter rolled heavily through the sleep of the lime burner and his little son. Dim shapes of horror and anguish haunted their dreams, and seemed still present in the rude hovel when they opened their eyes to the daylight. Up, boy, up, cried the lime burner, staring about him. Thank heaven the night is gone at last. Rather than pass such another, I would watch my lime kiln, wide awake for twelve months. This Ethan Brand, with his humbug of an unpardonable sin, has done me no such mighty favor in taking my place. He issued from the hut, followed by little Joe, who kept fast hold on his father's hand. The early sunshine was already pouring its gold upon the mountain tops, and though the valleys were still in shadow, they smiled cheerfully in the promise of the bright day that was hastening onward. The village, completely shut in by hills, which swelled away gently about it, looked as if it had rested peacefully in the hollow of the great hand of Providence. Every dwelling was distinctly visible. The little spires of the two churches pointed upwards, and caught a foreglimmering of brightness from the sun-gilt skies upon their gilded weathercocks. The tavern was astir, and the figure of the old smoke-dried stage agent, cigar in mouth, was seen beneath the stoop. Old Greylock was glorified with a golden cloud upon his head. Scattered likewise over the breasts of the surrounding mountains, there were heaps of hoary mist in fantastic shapes, some of them far down into the valley and others high up towards the summits, and still others of the same family of mist or cloud hovering in the gold radiance of the upper atmosphere. Stepping from one another of the clouds that rested on the hills, and thence to the loftier brotherhood that sailed in the air, it seemed almost as if a mortal man might thus ascend into the heavenly regions. Earth was so mingled with sky that it was a daydream to look at it. 
to supply that charm of the familiar and homely which nature so readily adopts into a scene like this. The stagecoach is rattling down the mountain road, and the driver sounded his horn while Echo caught up the notes and intertwined them into a rich and varied and elaborate harmony, of which the original performer could lay claim to little share. The great hills played a concert among themselves, each contributing a strain of airy sweetness. Well, little Joe's face brightened at once. Dear father, cried he, skipping cheerily to and fro, that strange man is gone, and the sky and the mountains all seem glad of it. Yes, growled the lime burner with an oath, but he's let the fire go down, and no thanks to him if five hundred bushels of lime are not spoiled. If I catch the fellow hereabouts again, I shall feel like tossing him into the furnace. With his long pole in his hand, he ascended to the top of the kiln. After a moment's pause, he called to his son. Come up here, Joe, said he. So little Joe ran up the hillock and stood by his father's side. The marble was all burnt into a perfect snow-white lime. But on its surface, in the midst of the circle, snow-white too and thoroughly converted into lime, lay a human skeleton in the attitude of a person who, after long toil, lies down to a long repose. Within the ribs, strange to say, was the shape of a human heart. "'Was the fellow's heart made of marble?' cried Bartram, in some perplexity at this phenomenon. "'At any rate, it's burnt to what looks like a special good lime, "'and taking all the bones together, my kiln is a half bushel the richer for him.' "'So saying, the rude lime-burner lifted his pole, "'and letting it fall upon the skeleton, "'the relics of Ethan Brand were crumbled into fragments.'